synchrotron light or by infrared sources. And uh, it, neutron, of course, is neutrons, and X-rays is uh, from a synchrotron. It could be a X-ray source, but the, uh, the scattering cross-section is so small that there is, I think, no experiment of inelastic at the scattering with uh, conventional sources. You see also that the resolution that you need or you use for these different experiments is different. It's about one centimeter minus one for Raman or infrared. It's much more smaller to, by pre, for prion scattering, but even much smaller than this. Uh, in neutral laser scattering, you can choose a little bit your resolution, mm -hmm. but as the last the, the scattering cross section is very small, you need to, to play a little bit to reduce the resolution to get more neutrons, more intensity. So usually you, you play in this zone. And each inelastic scattering, well, can play between, let's say, typically some centimeters minus one, except maybe uh, some particular experiments. Also, by the same reason, this, this scattering cross sections in both cases are, is small. Uh, last thing you see here is uh, that k is equal to zero for infrared uh, or Raman spectroscopy because we are dealing with uh, light and the momentum of light is very low and we need to conserve the momentum. So this is why we cannot create phonons with high momentum. And this, if we go back, means that we are going to deal with values of k very close to the center of the sun. That means either here or here. Okay, and this depends on the resolution. If you go here, you will need a good energy resolution. Then you will move to Brion, spectroscopy scattering. I will talk about this later. And if you stay here on the optical uh, funnels, then you, you will deal, for instance, with Raman spectroscopy. Okay. I'm going to speak mainly about Raman spectroscopy because uh, I don't have the time to go all this and I wrote a little bit about infrared or green scattering. There are other techniques where you can get information <coughs> for about the vibration of atoms or molecules or, or condensed matter system. You have ultrasound propagation that is going to deal with the speeds of sound that is uh, that is concerns uh, acoustic phonons. X-ray or neutral diffraction, you have yeah. any diffraction technique, current diffraction technique, you have the uh, the, the bipolar factor that that intervenes, so you can get relate this to this this directly relate to the vibration of the system. Or oh, exacts, for instance, it is a more local, but also includes information of the uh, vibration of the of the concerned atoms. But we are not going to discuss all this. But sometimes you need to combine different techniques to understand your system. Okay. Just a few words concerning the, the, these two techniques yes, to, to, get, to, to search something. I told you that you need large volume presses, and this can be, for instance, the Paris setting book press, and this allows you to get 12 gigapascal, even more. But if you want to preserve a number of neutrons scattered enough for, for doing inelastic neutron scattering, then it's better not to go very far in, uh, in pressure. That means keep a large volume. Uh, maybe Stefan Klotz can tell us that we can now do it even better. Uh, also, you can go to work to lower pressures and, and get higher volumes. In that case, you will get a better signal. So you have, depending on your problem, you can go with one or another. But you will be compelled to reduce your pressure domain in neutron uh, in elastic standards. Just an example to show you this could have been an example coming also from neutron in elastic scattering, but this is from X-ray in elastic scattering. X-ray in elastic scattering can use diamond apple cells, so in principle you can go to very high pressures. Here is 17 GPA in molybdenum, so this is one atom per cell. And you see here only acoustic branches, and you can measure, and these are the dots, and compare with calculations, the continuous and, and uh, discontinuous lines, the, uh, the phonon at uh, every K point. So this is a complete determination of the uh, vibrational modes of the system. There are different examples, but we will know all of it. So 
I'm going to concentrate on optical vibrations, that means infrared, <coughs> and Raman especially, talk a little bit on breathing. And you see the general principle is very simple. Infrared absorption is just, you put the sample and you measure the attenuated beam up and the uh, direct beam. And if you have some atten extra attenuations, you will need a reference. And this is something you, you need to do when, in a, when you have a, a complex environment like can be a diamond apple cells with a pressure transmitting medium. You will need to compare it. Uh, the principle here is an absorption experiment using as a, as a source synchrotron or infrared lamp. Synchrotron is emitting in all wavelengths, including infrared, just into the appropriate beam line. And in Raman or Brian or scattering, in analysis scattering, what we are going to use is one wavelength. So, and this best way is to, it's an optical wavelength. It can also be in a UV, yeah. So, but in the UV, if you combine it with high pressure, you're going to have to deal with the absorption of the diamond. So there are very few experiments that can deal with the UV, you have to reduce the, the energy, UV um, Raman or Brion scattering. So you use a laser excitation, and what you are going to look is the energy of the scattered, the inelastic scattered radiation. But we are going to go into more details. Concerning the, the optics, well, if I start from here, when you use Raman or Brion spectroscopy, you are using a laser with a one wavelength. So if you are going to optimize your objective to work correctly on this wavelength and have minimum chromatic aberrations, and you will focus it in your diamond angle cell. And, well, you don't need a very large aperture dark. It depends, of course, of the numerical aperture of the objectives you are going to use, of course. But in principle, most diamond angle cells can be used for Raman spectroscopy. That's not the case in infrared spectroscopy. Because you need to use, you want, you use a different wavelengths for the infrared radiation, then you will need to um, reduce the chromatic aberration and then refractive objects. Objects, if no, are, are not well adapted, it's better to use refractive focusing optics, and this is, for instance, the the most used, the cast grand objectives, and here you have how it focuses, and then this uh, reduces the, the, the space available for, for your cell, and uh, you need a, a large aperture, angular aperture for the diamond apple cell. So there are some geometrical constraints for infrared and high pressure compared to the The type of uh, so these are optical experiments. You need optical systems. For instance, this is how it works, a confocal Raman spectroscopy, spectrometer. So you have here the laser. You will have maybe a bandpass field spectrometer to, to uh, uh, eliminate the other uh, lines from your Raman, uh, for your, from your laser that you will not use, for instance. Then you can have some objectives to focus in, in a point that you will use as a spatial filter by putting a, a slit. I will just explain this afterwards. You see that you have that focusing point here, another here, and we'll see why this is used. It's quite important if you want to get a very good, good signal. Not fundamental, but this helps a lot. And then you are going to focus your, your, your light on your sample. It can be in a different path from the scattered signal for a scattered signal or be in the same path if you want and be totally backscattered. And then you have to collect this uh, signal in your spectrometer, but after, before this, because we have seen that the vibrations are uh, very, very low energy, mini electron volts. And so the, and this, uh, the energy of a laser is in, in the electron volt domain, so we are very close to the, to the, to the last laser line, so we will need then to uh, eliminate the uh, or reduce the intensity of the laser line because otherwise it will be very difficult to see the, the, the Raman signal. So we attenuate this by what's called notch filters that are bandpass filters using different technologies. Okay, but if you're doing a high pressure experiment, you also need to have a look to what's going on in your cell. 
So this is the unmountable cell, so you can put a light, and this light you can, with this mirror here, bring it to a camera. Or you can illuminate here with a light and get it in the camera to see what's going on. So this is a typical system. Uh, this confocal, uh, this lens, special filters that allows to do confocal spectroscopy, you can use for Raman or infrared. And I, I tell you just, it's very simple. If you have uh, here a sample, uh, here, a sample, which uh, in the diamond number cell, which uh, you have, will have light emitted from different points. You will see if you, you, this is lit, is open, that everything will get in your detector here. But if you reduce the size of, the, the, of your pinhole, you are going to stop what is coming from this point with respect to this one. So this means that you are going to reduce the depth of focus. So you are going to focalize in depth, and you can even make them depth studies in, in your cell. And you also will reduce any spurious scattering from, from around. So that's uh, an important advantage of alcohol focal systems. Uh, well, I, I just take the, the first part of a spectrometer. We have seen the last with the Pascaran optics for an infrared spectrometer. Uh, mm. Just speaking with, uh, with uh, Julio Pelletier that I spoke just, uh, just before, he told me it's a pity here that they don't have a confocal system. They don't in this wind line. And, and here they use as a source, uh, this is in the storage ring, uh, the synchrotron radiation, and then they use some optics to, first of all, go outside the ring wall and go to the beam line. And then when the beam is on the beam line, you have some optics to get the good high. And then, uh, because all this is in vacuum, because uh, otherwise you will absorb the X-rays that were coming before, uh, at a given point you have to go outside of vacuum and you have to go from a, out from a window. And it's better to use a, a diamond window because it will not absorb anything concerning infrared. So, uh, because you cannot make a very big window, then you are going to focus a little bit your beam to go through the window. So you have some mirrors here, toroidal mirror to focus here, and then, well, again, you are going to go uh, to, to drive things into the good height and go to your sample and uh, to, well, the sample uh, yeah, has been not good, and go then to the spectrometer that you want to analyze your light. And in, in this beam line, for instance, they can switch off, switch between synchrotron radiation, also infrared uh, lamp source, classical source, so it's possible to do both. And then you need the Caswan optics and your object. Okay. Let's uh, before before going to, through some ex, uh, examples for those that uh, do know not about do not know about this uh, uh, vibration spectroscopy. I I give you some uh, basics on 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 the technique concerning the, the fundamentals fundamentals and also about selection rules, but this is going to be very short. So in infrared absorption, we're going to absorb directly the light from a, a vibrational state to another one. So these are the vibrational states of, of the, in the crystal, the wavelengths that represent the phonons. And the, the operator that is going to be involved in this absorption process, or, or the process that is going to, to be, is, is the dipole, uh, the electric dipolar moment. That can be expressed as the sum of products in a molecule, if you think in a molecule, of the effective charge of one atom uh, times the distance to the center of gravity of your molecule. Okay? And that with this being x, y, z coordinate. So, in fact, your uh, in intensity of absorption is going to be uh, proportional to the sum for this nm transition, to so the sum of these terms here, so the, that involves the dipole moment operators, which in fact these terms are expressed as the sandwich of the uh, dipole moment operators between the, the uh, uh, ground state to the excited state. So if now you decide to um, develop uh, in a Taylor expansion the, the, the operator as uh, the uh, the operator, the, the, the dipole moment when there is no uh, displacement from, uh, of the atoms and taking here 
Q, the normal coordinates of the harmonic approximation. This will be the first, the first uh, term of the development for a small displacements around the equilibrium position. And, well, and it, you will need 3n minus 6 uh, coordinates to remove the translation and rotation that are with 3 plus 3, 6 uh, non-vibrating uh, um, um, degrees of freedom. So this, you end up with this term. Well, here you see you, will, you have chosen uh, coordinates, everything well. So these are orthonormal functions, so these will disappear. So you are just left with this term. And here you see that the fundamental term is going to be the derivative, the change of the electrodipolic moment when uh, you use with the vibration. Okay? And if you, for instance, write this, uh, co the normal coordinates in terms of, of the ladder operation, operators, you, you will see very easily that this term is only different of zero if uh, there is uh, uh, you just excite neighboring states in the harmonic approximation. This is, uh, can be anything if you are anharmonic. Okay, so this, this is the important thing in, in infrared absorption. Let's, uh, let's now look about light scattering. That is what happens in, in, a, in a Raman uh, spectroscopy. So you have the laser light with a given energy, nu zero, that is represented by this photon here, impinging on this diatomic molecule, which we have seen that the uh, normal coordinates is varying harmonically with a given frequency. And we want to know what happens with the scattered radiation. Okay, this is a classical approach, and this can be written quantically, uh, but uh, it's not, I think, that the object is here. Okay, we'll have, uh, when you have light uh, approaching a molecule or an atom, you can uh, displace the charge due to the electric field, and then you create a polarization, and this polarization depends on the polarizability alpha, and polarization will be alpha times E, and this alpha is a characteristic of the atom or the, the crystal. So we can write the, polariz the polarization in terms of polarizability, the new, sorry, electric dipole in uh, terms of polarizability. And again, we can say that they expand the polarizability as a function of the uh, normal coordinates of the vibration. Okay, so we'll have an alpha zero, and then here a linear term. Of course, others, but we will stop at linear. And now, if you replace in this expression this alpha and this E, you end up with these two terms here. In this one, you have nu zero, and in this other term, you will find nu m and nu zero. We have a product of cosinus, and this product of cosinus we can write as the sum of cosinus of the difference and some of the frequencies. So we end with these three terms having three different frequencies, as you see. This one is the same frequency that the impinging light, that is what we call relic scattering. So this is elastic scattering. And these two other terms correspond to what is called the stocks and anti stocks scattering. What means stocks and anti stocks? You see that you will have light that it will be laser minus the vibration of the, the energy of vibration of your phonon. That means what? That, in fact, your light has been used to create a phonon and it has lots of su such energy. So this is energy, uh, it's phonon creation and this will be a phonon uh, annihilation. Okay, so this is the stocks and anti stock process. Well, that means that if, when you do a Raman spectra, you find such kind of things. You have here illuminated, uh, we'll take as reference energy the energy of the impinging light. So this is zero, arbitrary. And when we look to the difference with respect to, the, to this energy. And this energy, we have said that the Nash filter is going to suppress. This is why it is so attenuated here, because normally this is very, very, very intense. And if you don't attenuate, you will be, it will be very difficult to, to measure these very low energy phonons. So, and you see that for each line represents a, a phonon, a vibration, and you have the symmetric in each case, that's the stocks and anti-stocks. 
right? the annihilation and creation of phonons. Okay, and you see also, and this we will discuss just in a second, that the intensity of the stocks and anti-stocks are not exactly the same. Right? They, 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 are, they are different, and this is going to be useful in some cases. Okay, we have then, if we consider now uh, what are the, uh, the um, that the electrolyte double moment, this is what determines its variation, is what determines the infrared, then you understand that we need changes of this and then when you move the internal nuclear distance. And if there is any, we'll see with examples, but if there is any asymmetrical stretching or bending on internal rays, then we'll need a change in the dipole moment of the molecule. And this means that asymmetrical stretching and bending will be infrared active because asymmetrically will change the dipolar moment and then make this uh, uh, term appearing in, in the infrared uh, intensity different of zero. In Raman, what we need is a change of the polarizability when we have the vibration. These are examples that you will find in any classical text and maybe books, and many of you have, have seen this. Let's consider the vibration of a CO2 molecule. And the polarizability is relating to vectors and is a tensor. And one way to represent this tensor is by an ellipsoid. And here you have, when Q, the, the, the vibration normal coordinate is equal to zero, that this is a stress position of the molecule, the, the polarizability, okay, and what, well, in the CO2 molecule, to start with, uh, you have <coughs> negative, uh, negative, positive, negative. So you have two vectors like that of polarization. That's the polar net polarization is zero. So you don't have infrared. And when you make a symmetric vibration, we'll have, like here, this one like that, this stretching mode will not have any infrared uh, intensity. So this is non-infrared, but will be Raman active because uh, the polarizability is going to be large, change more rapidly when you change from this position, and this is represented here, and smaller when you expand it, and this is represented here. For this vibration, the polarizability will change like that. So the derivative of the polarizability, this value at zero, is different of zero. And then we have a Raman active mode. You see that in that case, we have an asymmetric stretching, and here uh, uh, a bending that is asymmetric. So this will mean that in that case, we will have infrared active modes because polarization will change. But uh, in terms of polarizability, you see that we are totally symmetric here on the polarization, on the polarizability, and this means that you are in such a situation in these two vibrations, the polarizability is increasing or decreasing. They are in a maximum and a minimum, and then the derivative is equal to zero. So these two modes will be Raman inactive. So you see Raman active and Raman inactive, and this is characteristic of any center symmetrical molecule or crystal. In the case of H2O, for instance, in which you have not a linear molecule, then you see here the equilibrium position. And of course, here you have a non-zero polarization, polariz and that's electrical dipole, sorry. That means that you will be, uh, that change in addition when you move from it. And this means that you have then infrared activity for all. And you see that you are not symmetric on in node of these cases. So these are all Raman and infrared active, okay? So you have already a kind of selection uh, rules that you can see from the symmetry diagram of the molecule. And you, we have seen that we have what we call a mutual expression rule. In, in cent center, if you have a center of symmetry in the molecule, then you will either have Raman scattering a lot uh, transitions or infrared transition, but not both at the same time. Uh, this is, we have seen this for a linear molecule, but it's also valid for nonlinear molecules. And here is an example of CO2 in which you see here is an absorption infrared 
spectrum, you see the, the, the three different modes present here. Uh, the, well, the, the ones that are active. Uh, and you see also combination of them. You have, we, we told that you can combine phonons. So you have so the additional of two phonons here. And, and in the, um, for the Raman, uh, you will have only one here, but you have also an overtone that is added here that is calculated in that case. So you have uh, these two active Raman and several infrared, but they are not in the same place. But they are mutually exclusive. It's more rich because of these combinations that you can have of different points. But this, all this tells you nothing about the intensities in general. Okay? These only selection rules only tell you if you have or you have not. And when you have, the intensity can be very low depending on the cross-sections involved. So um, sometimes when you look to the uh, vibrations that you have in a, in a crystal or in a molecular system, you have intensities that appear in calculations, but you cannot see in, the, in your spectrum. Okay, um, maybe I, go, I don't go through this just to tell you, because otherwise I cannot go through examples, that uh, theory group allows you uh, to do this more in detail, and I gave you here a reference with, uh, you have many of them, but I gave you this because I think the book is only 12 euros, so it's very, very cheap, and it's, not, it's very good. So if you need to, 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 uh, to use uh, selection rules uh, with growth theory, you, you can go through this. Uh, and one of the consequences of all what we have said is uh, in a crystal, the point group groups of the, of the crystal uh, concern that are involved in that crystal, the symmetry of the crystal is going to be different depending on the structure. So Raman or infrared are going to be techniques that allows clearly to detect any phase transition. Here I put just an example of CO2 uh, at high pressure and at high temperature, and you see different, very characteristic and different bands with here this notation that tells you the symmetry of, of, the, of the modes. And this allows, combine it, for instance, with calculations to identify your, your, your crystal structure. Of course, it's not as good as diffraction for identification, but can be, uh, allow you maybe sometimes more clearly to see the presence of two faces, like here, in which you have this star that is the presence of another face. Well, here is an, uh, a summary of, of uh, difference between Raman and infrared. One thing to, to, that I haven't said is that in Raman spectrum you need uh, to cope n also with the fluorescence that, can, that is having a scattering section that is much important than Raman. So to eliminate it, uh, it, especially from the diamonds, then you need to use diamonds that have low fluorescence selected. In the case of infrared, it's even more difficult because you can have absorption for the nitrogen impurities. So it's better to use what you call the diamond 2A which have 10 minus 3 ppm of, of, uh, of nitrogen. Well, I wanted to tell you about Raman and Brion scattering. You will have in the slides because, but I, I give you a couple of examples to finish. Because I, I, I've been too, too, well, tell me, just reason on Raman scattering because very important. In fact, a Raman process, the incident photon is going to be absorbed between initial states and electronic states. So electrons are involved. And then you are going to go to, to, go to, emit, to, to create a phonon and emit the energy of the phonon. Well, absorb a, or, or here it is, uh, the stock, so you are going to emit a phonon. And then the light is going to relax from this state to the initial state. So it's a three-step process. And the three-step process, you can represent it in the Feynman diagram with the energy and momentum conservation. And you will be involved with the absorption process involving the radiation and the electron, electron phonon processes, electron and the lattice, this is why L is here, and the Hamiltonian, again, of the electron and radiation to scatter the phonon. And using the Fermi golden rule and second order uh, perturbation theory, you end up with a probability of transition having this shape with the sandwiches concerning these three processes here, okay, 
But what is very interesting is to see that you have here denominators that can go to zero and make this infinite. And this, when um, in this process, if, the, if these states are real, states, the electronic states are real, then you can go really through this, because they can be virtual, but if they are real states, you can go through really and make this zero, and then the Raman process is going to be resonant. How to do it? Just by selecting correctly the incident wave to create this absorption. This is the easiest way. Also, you can do it uh, in the relaxation process, but I will not talk about this. So let me just go very rapidly through a couple of illustrations. One is hydrogen. Hydrogen chain have a vibron that you can follow with Raman spectroscopy. And this uh, is a work from Paul Lubert in which uh, that contains data from his work, but many others have also measured this at low temperature. So this vibron, you see, uh, that increases a little bit in frequency and then goes down. And if you look in the literature, at the beginning, when people were saying that it was going down, they would think, oh, we are close to the to the metallization and the dissociation of uh, hydrogen. And, and, and that you know that is now proposed to be probably at 450 gigapascals, something like that. So it is not, this is coming from the interaction of other molecules, quadrupolar interactions, and you have this. But you can use it to identify phase transitions, like here, between the two and three is very clear. Less clear here between the one and two, but looking into details, you see the slope is different. Um, <coughs> and well, uh, some years ago, we have a big revolution in the, because the, there was this work from Erimetz that say, oh, uh, I've been able now to measure uh, the, the vibron, not at a low temperature, but at ambient temperature. It was difficult to measure the hydrogen at, uh, at uh, ambient temperature because it diffuses in the diamond and makes it break. But he used an isolating layer, and he managed to do uh, the experience, and you see that uh, this is the, the, the red points, uh, and they had a strong change here. Well, it, just, just have a look. 4.2, this is hydrogen, 3 is deuterium, 4.2 divided by 3, and uh, this is 1.4. This is the square root of 2. This is exactly the ratio between the two masses of the uh, the square root of the two masses, 4 divided by 2. So we, we see that in the first formula, we see we have an isotopic effect here on the, on the elastic constant and the frequency. Sorry, the frequency. Well, so Hermit so, so and Trojan, they saw this change here very, very, very rapidly with respect to the one of uh, at. And again, they conclude, oh, well, not only from this, but it could be then that we are getting the metallic state and the announced maybe a little bit fast that they were going to the metallic state, coupled also with other uh, uh, electric measurements. But it's not, again. And I just show you here the data because you, you have a, a, a something that is, well, you have here the evolution of the fibron. But look at this, this you, you recognize what is this? This, this is the diamond signal, okay? And this is interesting because this front here, it moves with pressure. And this is a Raman signal, the Raman from the diamond, that you can use this front here edge for megabar pressures as also a pressure gauge. Probably, I don't know if you got this on the previous lectures. It's one of the pressure gauge you can use. Okay, uh, the east, well, this you will see during, because it's just uh, the, the announcement of the 203 Kelvin uh, superconductivity, but I think there will be a lot of it on, on the on the conference, so I, I want just to give, tell you a couple of things on single wall carbon nanotubes, because here you can do resonance scattering. And in single wall carbon nanotubes, you know all kind of nanotubes is graphene, you roll it, depending on how you roll it, you define a vector with respect to the hexagonal lattice of graphite with indexes NM, and this is what's called chirality, and, you, and this you have different rolling uh, tubes that can be metallic or semiconducting, and this is a one-dimensional system, and in the electronic structure of one-dimensional systems have the, what's called the Van Hoff singularity. So this is the density of the states as a function of energy, schematized for a semiconducting tube. And you see this, this singularity that is Van Hoff. And this means that you have a very strong absorption probability from this very highly populated state to this empty, highly uh, with a number of states available very, very high. 
and the selection rules makes that you can do this such transition. And in fact, one tube of a given diameter here will have those transitions that are allowed. Okay? So for each single one of the tube, you will have a number of transitions like that. And this is represented for many, many chiralities here. Okay? So if in the, in the Raman spectra of a, of a nanotube is characterized by two main peaks that are shown here. The G band, they corresponds to the optical phonons that you see represented here with different symmetry. They contribute here. And one very characteristic mode that is the radial breathing mode that is very low energy, you see? And this radial breathing mode, it is related to the diameter of the tube by this <coughs> formula. There are other disordered or G prime bands that involve second order uh, processes, uh, Rama processes, I'm not going to this class. Uh, look uh, here, this graph shows these transitions as a function of the diameter. And here is the transition energy. Then what you can see here is here we have a sample with tubes that are in this diameter. There are many tubes in such that diameter, so in this blue line. And if you use light in the red region as for to excite this, that is red light, you will excite only the Raman modes here. And if you use light in this region, you only will excite the Raman modes of those tubes here. So, and this gives different signal because you have different processes in these tubes, but they are tubes that are different. So this is a selective way you, to use Raman, resonant Raman, okay? To choose the wavelength to choose here the sample you want to excite. In the radial breathing modes, you can see the same thing. These are tubes that are with diameter bigger than these ones, and you have modes the, here you see stokes and anti-stokes, and you have modes at different frequencies because we have this formula that we saw, the frequency is inverse to the diameter. Okay, so you can identify the chiralities of the tube. And for instance, you can follow, uh, even see here, single chirality radial breathing modes, having two components because they are tubes that are empty and the others fill it with water. And these are the two components for a 6-4 tube, 7-2, this is the indexes of chirality. And we have been able to follow them with pressure. So you have the two components here evolving with pressure. Here you have how the frequency moves of the radial breathing modes. And you see that you, the difference between the empty and filled is always increasing with pressure. So we have a water supporting tube effect uh, that increases with pressure. And, uh, but, oh, sorry. One process that takes place under high pressure with tubes is the radial collapse. At a given point, the tubes are going to volize and even collapse like that. And this was predicted to have this collapse pressure as a function of diameter, one over the radius of the tube to the power three. This is a theoretical production. But all experimental values were much, much bigger than this. So what was going on there? We did experiments here following the G-band, the optical modes of different tubes, these tubes, these tubes, and these tubes, and at a given point, all turn out to follow graphite. And this is normal because you go from this to this, and you see here you have more like graphitic folds. And what, does it, what is this? In fact, these are all filled tubes. This is a tubes filled with paraffin oil. These are tubes filled with fullerens. And these are tubes with, filled with other tubes. And if you look to tubes, that are empty, and this is not so easy I, to, 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 to do it, but these are selected empty tubes, then if you see, follow the modes, you will see that there is a, a change here. And if this change here in the G-band, at the same time, the radial modes disappear. And this is a clear signature of this transition, which takes place at a pressure that is much more and smaller than the ones that we are seeing, seeing precedently. But I put these transitions here. When you use empty tubes, and individualized, in addition, you get these values here, in perfect agreement with theory. And all the others that you have in the literature most have filled tubes, and this is why they are there. Okay, so this explains the, the difference. So, I, I will stop with this because I think I, I, I'm really late. How to conclude, just by telling you that really you can go to any condensed matter systems with, uh, vibrational spectroscopy and 
explore all the physics. I've not talked about uh, the real physics like uh, uh, like uh, phonon electron phonon couplings in, in superconductors that you can also probe with uh, with uh, this vibrational spectroscopy and many others. But so just uh, as you know, have fun and thanks for your attention. Okay. I'm sorry to yeah, have been a little bit to, late. We have to apologize because we, we were disturbing you with some problems <laughs> with the recording the audio of the, of the talk. So you want just one quick question? Please. Uh, I have a small question. In phase transition, we have direct lines of new peak on the uh, diagram, or it may be some uh, the feedback are not so sharp, the scattering. I haven't understood. To detect the phase transitions, yes. we uh, directly have to observe new uh, peaks on the Raman spectrum. Well, can or it may be just scattering of some. Well, you have uh, many, many different cases. Uh, you can have the disappearance of all peaks. For instance, if in the high pressure phase uh, or whatever, in the, after the phase transition, there are not symmetry alloyed, for instance. You can have the, the, the disappearance of the peaks. You can have the isostructural changes in which maybe this is slope of the evolution of the peaks with pressure that is going to change. So they, 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 uh, there are many, many yeah, different many cases. Pieces. Yeah, yeah. I've shown some of them, but there yeah, are many. <laughs>